Welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Jim Zogby, and I'm talking to Tarita Parsi, co-founder and president of the National Iranian American Council, about his new book, A Single Roll of the Dice, Obama's Diplomacy with Iran. We were talking, we started about where we are today, and then we went back to the beginning to see how this sad saga unfolds. Um, there was the promise, and then it collapsed. Um, but it collapsed over a three-year period. Um, without, again, getting into the, the intricacies of the negotiations mm -hmm. and the stops and the starts, I want to talk about the three sides, the three major sides mm -hmm. in this, uh, and, and what each of the problems were. Uh, first, the, the U.S. side. Uh, there was the, uh, the pr I guess one could start with just the divisions in the administration, the, the fact that it was not speaking with one voice almost from the beginning. Uh, the president had, I, I, just let me take a side here. I, I was part of the campaign early on, and I remember when he, he made that speech about engagement, or actually mm. responded to a YouTube question yeah. saying that he would engage. People in the campaign were saying, oh no, he's got to back away from that, and he didn't. <laughs> Yeah. And in fact, in succeeding debates, when challenged about you have to be tough and negotiate, he said, if you're tough and negotiate, you're not negotiating. Yeah. I mean, he rejected a dual track approach. Yeah. But then the very people who were hired from the senior most positions on down were the very people who argued with him the most during the campaign. That had an impact on policy. I believe so. I believe it certainly did, because at the end of the day, the assumption after the policy review, which was finished in mid-April, was based on the dual track. And there was pressure also, both from Israel, particularly from France, that they were afraid that Obama would abandon the dual track. Mm. In fact, I write in the book that there were so many different tensions, even with some of America's most closest allies, even some of them who, in a way, favor diplomacy. And I write that of many of America's allies, many of them wished Obama well few wished him success mm -hmm. because they had major differences. And I would say that the adoption the, of the dual track principle was ultimately a mistake. It's again not something that was completely compatible with the original vision that Obama had laid out. And, and so the, it, the personnel issue became a huge problem. I wouldn't say necessarily become huge, but you have a situation in which you have a president with a specific vision and a lot of other policy folks that have worked on this issue for a longer time that don't necessarily share the vision mm -hmm. in that same way. I'm not saying that they're not loyal to the president, but till this day, people in the White House tell me that the person in the White House who believes most in the promise of engagement is Obama. Mm -hmm. That in a way is positive, but it also has a negative side. The negative side is, why aren't there more people that share his optimism? And then there was domestic pressure. Absolutely. And I would say particularly because of what happened in Iran, what the Iranians did in the elections, when in my view, massive fraud, but more importantly, the subsequent human rights abuses. And all of those images on TV, one senior Obama administration official that I interviewed told me that Congress has from the outset been somewhat skeptical about engagement. But after the elections in Iran, they became outright hostile. Until this day, this little balancing act, this struggle over the policy direction, over the frame of the policy between Congress and the Obama administration has been one major factor as to why we've seen less and less diplomacy and more and more pressure. And then there were lobbies who had a Absolutely. distinct interest in pushing the hand of the administration. Without a doubt without a doubt. And that, of course, works through Congress. And you had a lot of pressure from Israel as well. I mean, the Israelis were clear on the record that they were not in favor of this diplomatic engagement. And they were trying to impose on it a 12-week deadline. And you, sh you tell me which negotiations have been successful in 12 weeks. They tried to impose on it an objective that Obama had not adopted, which is the complete elimination of the nuclear program. They also tried to impose sanctions on Iran prior to the talks, which again completely contradicted Obama's principle and vision. And the last point, which I think was quite decisive, Obama tried to demilitarize the atmosphere, demilitarize the narrative and the discourse. And you showed the video from Omnor Ruz. That's all part of it. But every time he did that, by not constantly referring to the military option being on the table, the Israelis did exactly the opposite because of their calculation that if the military option is not on the table very visibly and every 
and refer to every five minutes, the Iranians won't have any impetus to negotiate. There was another issue, and that was the way the administration created a linkage with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which sort of pushed the Israelis to both uh, want to downplay the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but accelerate the Iran in order to distract uh, administration focus. Exactly. The two sides adopted the opposite linkage. The Israelis under Netanyahu were arguing that there's nothing that can be done in Israel until Iran is handled first. The administration was saying in order to handle Iran, we have to have progress on the Palestinian issue. In fact, to a certain extent, the administration followed my recommendation from my previous book, saying the only way of successfully dealing with these two issues is by doing it in parallel. But it requires a significant amount of political capital and will to sustain it and make sure that it doesn't become a victim of the pressures that the Netanyahu government put on Obama. We've talked about the, the Israelis and about the Americans, but the Arab states, um, number one, felt left out. Yes. Uh, number two, had been in some ways victim of the revolution from 79 and felt threatened um, and had their own concerns. Uh, and they made them known. I mean, WikiLeaks have been clear about that. But beyond that, it's, it's very clear that the, uh, the Arabs didn't want a grand bargain which wrote them out of the equation and had the U.S. negotiating with Iran and leaving them out of the picture, yeah. they weighed in too. Absolutely, and I think you have a quote from uh, a Saudi official in the book, uh, Prince Turkey, in which he says that the, he views the grand bargain as code word for the idea that every decision in the region has to go through Tehran first. This fear on the Saudi side, and it's particularly the Saudi side, that there would be some sort of uh, rapprochement and love feast between the United States and the Islamic Republic that would lead to a reemergence of Iranian hegemony in the region. A similar fear that the Israelis have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there was a lot of um, unhappiness on the Saudi side. And we should not forget there is a common view in the Arab world that what the United States did in Iraq and what it did in Afghanistan that enabled Iran to become a far more powerful state. It became the kingmaker of the political order of these two states after first having had tremendous enmities with them, that this was not just a mistake. This was a deliberate policy to actually enhance Iran's position, which of course sounds preposterous to ears here in Washington, D.C., and we know that it's not true. But there is a disbelief on the Arab side that could the United States really have been this incompetent? After and that's I, the background I, as to why there's this suspicion of what Obama would do. After I wrote my do. book, mm -hmm. Arab Voices, which talk about myths Americans have about Arabs, and I'd go around the country and talk, Americans would say to me, well, what do the myths Arabs have about us? And the yeah. first one I'd say is, they think we're smart. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that, you know, really dumb things like the Iraq yeah. War had to have a design, and that's yeah. the one. Yeah. Not only make Iran strong, but also create a dependency, yeah. making the Arabs need America more as the part of a protective shield. Yeah. But the, yeah. that, you're right, that plays out very strongly. Yeah. And I was in Saudi uh, while I was writing the book and had a good opportunity to speak to a lot of officials there. And you could really sense it. Uh, there was a tremendous suspiciousness, both in U.S. intentions, suspiciousness about U.S. competence. Uh, and all of this creates paranoia. Mm -hmm. And the paranoia causes the countries to put pressures against things that they're fearful of. And as you note, mm -hmm. if there were any chance this were going to work, um, the internal Iranian situation blew it all apart. Absolutely. And it was the election itself that did it. In my assessment, of all the different things that eliminated and ate away Obama's political space, this one did more harm to it than anything the Israelis tried to do or anything the Saudis tried to do or anything that Congress managed to do, at least in 2009. That was the biggest blow. But there's a flip side to it as well that I think is important to keep in mind. Part of the mistake in my assessment that Obama committed is that he tried to negotiate while adapting to the very limited and further limiting political space in Washington without trying to create more space for his policy. Mm. He constantly tried to adapt to it. Uh, and I think ultimately that is a mistake. You're not going to be able to resolve a 30-year-old enmity by adapting to the political landscape that gave birth to it and that has perpetuated it. You have to recreate that landscape. You have to fight for more political space. The Iranians have to do exactly the same thing. And they didn't do that either, incidentally. Mm -hmm. uh, so while we can say that all of these restrictions came and limited Obama, we also have to ask, 
What did Obama do to expand his space? Mm -hmm. I want to talk a bit about the internal situation in Iran because the w what many have noted as the sort of the maddening brinkmanship that the Iranians play, uh, the inability to close a deal, to, to get close and then pull back and get close and pull back, springs, you note, from internal conflicts in the country itself. Uh, the, the inability to, to make a deal is because there's no consensus at home about the deal. Absolutely. Or at a minimum, even when there may be a consensus about a deal, there's no consensus about how the credit for the deal will be distributed amongst various political factions that in 09 literally were at war with each other. So that even the reformers, or the people heralded here in America as reformers, mm -hmm. We're taking a harder line against Ahmadinejad making a deal with America than the conservatives were. Not harder than the conservatives, but Ahmadinejad ended up being the person who wanted the deal the most in 2009. Mm. But the reformers were critical of it. And I don't think they were critical of it in the sense that they wanted to scuttle it. But they wanted to make sure that Ahmadinejad, who had just brutalized the Iranian population, would not be able to get political credit, credit. and become stronger yeah. as a result of it. By the end of the whole thing, Mm. Um, as we approach the deadline for UN sanctions, uh, the vote on sanctions, um, Turkey and Brazil uh, come in and conclude an agreement with Tehran um, and they thought that it was over. Okay, Iran now agrees to what everybody wanted them to agree to, but it was greeted as too little, too late and not trusted. Trust had broken down, and the dynamic here at home had reached the point where the president, even if he wanted to accept it, couldn't have without running into a headlong clash with Congress in the yeah. middle of a health care debate. Yeah. One Obama official, a former at this point, uh, in a moment of great honesty, told me that the Iranians really messed it up in 2009, in October, in the negotiations. But the Obama administration kind of messed up what the Brazilians and the Turks succeeded in doing in May 2010. Yeah. Because they actually had a letter from President Obama three and a half weeks before Lula and Erdogan goes to Tehran and they have an 18 hour, very intense, at times quite um, uh, difficult negotiations with the Iranians. And they managed to get the Iranians to agree to everything that was in the letter that President Obama had sent them. And that they thought meant that it would be accepted by Obama. In fact, they showed the letter in the negotiations to the Iranians and saying, if you agree to this, we already have secured America's agreement, mm. and it will be a breakthrough. Amorim, the Brazilian foreign minister, ecstatic. They fly to Istanbul. After that, he calls Secretary Clinton, and he tells her about the details of the deal, and to his surprise, she says, this is unacceptable. And he tells her, but this follows the letter, and there's a long pause. And Amorim believes that it may be because Secretary Clinton may not have known about the letter that Obama had sent them. Mm. I find that incredible because in the research that I did, I did come across a lot of senior folks, including Brazilian, U.S. diplomats in Brazil that did not know about the letter. Mm. But it became quite embarrassing. And it, what it showed was that between a nuclear breakthrough and sanctions, because two days before uh, Lula had arrived in Tehran, Russia and China, China had finally agreed to sanctions resolution. And the Brazilians and the Turks didn't know this. Mm. But between the two, Obama chose the sanctions. And I believe so he didn't do so because he wanted to, but because as one official told me, the U.S. had simply run, the administration had run out of political space. Congress was coming at him as a steamroll. They had nothing to show for, for their diplomacy. Congressional elections were coming up. And Congress would have gone forward with their, san their own sanctions anyways, which would have targeted Russia and China and would have created a conflict within the Security Council that the Iranians could take advantage of. Let me talk about this. Um, the, we've talked the Israelis and the Arabs and the U.S. and Iran, but Russia and China are big players here um, who agreed to sanctions uh, after siding with Iran for quite a while. Uh, Russia not always trusting, but China actually being more dependent because of, it, of oil. Uh, first, what did they get? Uh, what did Russia get to make them come on board with the sanctions resolution? What it, turned them? It's quite interesting. Uh, in talking to other countries in the Security Council about these negotiations, they were very frustrated. 
because most of the negotiations about the sanctions resolution really was not about what would work and what would not work with the Iranians. It's about the Russians and others carving out exemptions so that the sanctions would not affect their policies. And one perm non-permanent member uh, state from the Security Council expressed deep frustrations over the fact that his country would not be able to do a lot of regular trade with Iran as a result of this, but Russia would be able to continue to do nuclear collaboration with Iran as a result of the carve-outs in the resolution. But the main things that was agreed upon, this was in the context of the reset between Russia and the United States, and that was uh, the missile defense shield, it was the issue about Star 2, it was making sure that the Iranians would not get the S-300s from the Russians. So it was a lot of deal-making between the United States and Russia in order to get them to agree. What the Chinese got is less clear. The Chinese tell me that they got nothing. I'm sure they got something at the end of the day. Um, but the bottom line is this came at the expense of a breakthrough that obviously would not have been the best deal, would not have been as good of a deal as it would have been in 2009, but we would have been in a very different situation today, in my assessment, if we had accepted that opening and then built upon it. What are, what are Russian interests here? A and I ask this because we now have the serious situation unfolding, and Russia and China are on one side. I is, it, is it possible that they be pulled away in the same way they were pulled away from Iran? Or are greater interests at stake in the Syria clash, although I couldn't see how. Iran has at least oil, uh, Syria doesn't. I mean, what is, what, what were the Chinese and Russian interests in Iran that ultimately were forsaken, or there, did they not have to forsake the interests? There's a couple of issues here. First of all, Russia and China have far more deep and broad ties with Iran. Yeah. Um, America's relations with Iran are characterized by a set of problems. China and Russia's relations with Iran is characterized by a whole set of opportunities, problems, issues, etc. Trade, investments. Uh, Iran is a big market for Chinese goods. Uh, China is a big consumer of Iranian oil. Uh, moreover, these two countries do not view the threat of an Iranian nuclear capacity in the same manner that the United States does. In fact, the Russians and the Chinese recognize Iran's right to enrich, do not have a problem with Iranians enriching as long as it is under IEA inspections. They obviously have a problem with weaponization, but they don't view the weaponization factor in the same type of alarmist way that the United States and certainly Israel does. So they have a very different perspective on this. I think the Russians in particular have probably benefited from this conflict quite a lot because the more the tensions have risen, the more the Russians have managed to get both concessions from the U.S. and from the Iranians and play both against each other. I think we've come to the end of the road in that precisely because of what you mentioned in Syria and the Arab Spring. When the Arab Spring first happened, the first governments that fell were governments that were pro-Western and dependent on the West. The Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians were applauding. They were as happy as could be. Then suddenly it shifts with Libya and then potentially Syria, in which you start to see that other governments uh, could fall as well. And the Russian and the Chinese fear is that the United States, in their words, would hijack the Arab Spring and turn it into a phenomena that would increase the number of pro-American states in the region rather than decrease it. And in the Libyan example, of course, there's a lot of anger from the Russian and the Chinese perspective because this was supposed to only be a no-fly zone, which ended up becoming a regime change resolution. And one Chinese um, uh, counterpart <coughs> told me that the Chinese calculation was that they came in with an abstention, they did not have any impact on the outcome, but they paid all of the negative costs as if they had given a veto because they were not with the majority. And as a result, they decided, now twice, in Syria to put in a veto because at least it will affect the outcome. They'll get the same negatives as if they had abstained. But they're not going to permit more independent regimes, as they view them, fall in order to get these countries to become pro-American, and particularly not on Iran, since it is an, uh, such an important country in the region, has so much oil, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not quite sure about the Russian situation, but it appears to me that the Chinese are, I might use the expression, sitting pretty. Mm -hmm. in, in all of this. They don't seem to pay a price, um, and they continue to have their 
market share, if you will. Um, and the U.S. gets itself into hot water or embroiled in a conflict uh, that it may or may not come out of ahead, although in many of these situations the U.S. has come up behind, and the Chinese just keep doing business and growing. Yes, though I would say part of the reason why the Chinese may not be paying a very high price right now is because the Russians are paying a higher price. The Chinese are a little bit more in the background, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. But I think the Chinese calculation is far longer term in the sense that uh, what would be the long-term effects uh, of that type of a transformation mm -hmm. in the region in which Chinese inroads would, mo would be more difficult. China has greater trade with Saudi Arabia and imports more Saudi oil than it does Iranian. <laughs> And there's a belief in some quarters in the United States that China would really move closer to Saudi Arabia. My conversations with Chinese counterparts have given me a different impression in which they have said that since Saudi Arabia's security ultimately depends on its alliance with the United States, China cannot ultimately rely on Saudi Arabia. Whereas with Iran, it's a different situation. So they're looking at it very long term, particularly projecting towards some sort of a potential showdown between the United States and China in the Middle East 20 years or so from now. What would each of those two countries do should there be an armed conflict or an attack? It's difficult. I don't foresee that the Chinese and the Russians would move in militarily to support Iranians. The only assets the Iranians would have are their own allies such as Hezbollah. But I would find it quite likely that the Russians and the Chinese would provide military or sell arms, etc., etc. Um, the Chinese have not necessarily been too harmed by the United States shooting itself in the foot in, in the region by going in militarily. Uh, but I think they have invested so heavily uh, in Iran, so they're not going to sit idly by and permit the regime to fall. Talk and it's, it's an important point here. It's so sad for the populations. The Syrian people are being massacred right now. Mm. They're a pawn in this, geopol this reignited geopolitical game, and so are the Iranian people. Yeah, the, the Syrian conflict has gone from being a conflict in Syria to a conflict over Syria, yeah. and a great power conflict, much exactly. like we saw during the Cold War. Exactly. Yeah. And Iran could move in the same direction. Tell me about uh, Iraq. You have not talked about Iraq, and you don't mention Iraq much in the book, it, but it's, a, um, it's both a player and a pawn. Yes. Well, it's more of an actor in the sense of being an arena for conflict, but I wouldn't say that the Iraqi government have reached that level of independence and power and influence to be able to actually affect the outcome decisively. So that's part of the reason it's not very prominent uh, in the analysis. But it's interesting because part of Obama's original strategic rationale for doing diplomacy with Iran was because of the way it could facilitate a solution in Iraq and Afghanistan. And some Obama administration officials privately, and I think semi-publicly even, admit that one of the mistakes that they defined for themselves in how they, think, how they did things in 2009 was that they pursued diplomacy singularly on the nuclear issue. There may have been a greater promise if the agenda had been broadened to include Iraq, to include Afghanistan. And go and address those issues at the same time instead of making the very difficult nuclear issue a precondition for negotiations on other issues. The result is that there's no nuclear deal but also no discussion exactly. on any of the broader exactly. issues. And several administration officials when I spoke to them expressed regret about that and they think that had they done it again perhaps the voice of Richard Holbrook would have been listened to a little bit more because he was very eager to starting diplomacy very quickly because he knew quite well the likelihood of success in Afghanistan in the absence of at least a better functioning dialogue there's with Afghanistan, Israel. There's Afghanistan, there's Iraq, there's Lebanon, there's involvement Absolutely. in the Israeli-Palestinian issue. There yeah. are places, places that Iran meddles or, or interferes. One of the things that I noted in our polling is that when public hostility toward Iran from America and Israel are highest, mm -hmm. uh, Iran's favorable ratings in the Arab world go up. Mm -hmm. But when is this post yeah. 09 and post Syria yeah. though? Uh, no, it's okay. it's it's not. It goes up to, to well actually it does. It goes up to 2000, 2011. Yeah, but after Syria, it probably we won't. have not done it since, okay. since Syria. Yeah. Um, but when the Iran is seen in its own right, yeah, um, the, the numbers go down, yeah. and the meddling of Iran becomes a problem in, exactly. in on the Arab exactly. street. And the Iranians know this very well. That's part of the reason why they favor a narrative that puts the Israeli-Palestinian issue at the center of the regional 
uh, conversation yeah. in which they then use their position as a far more um, uh, stronger opponent to the U.S. or Israeli position on this in order to curry favor on the Arab street. But once the conversation changes its center of gravity towards domestic Iranian politics or what the Iranians are doing in Syria, then the numbers change dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it was interesting I to see. I always say about the Israeli yeah. thing, they created a hysteria at home. Yeah. But Israel's not the target of Iran, it's no, Iran's no. foil. Exactly, exactly. Um, listen, Trita, a remarkable book. Thank you, thank and, you so much. And one, as I've said, well worth reading, and I thank you for writing it. Uh, that's all the time we've got for now. Thank but you for uh, I appreciate you. you being here, and I recommend the book. Um, it, is, uh, it is a book you should read. Not only, as I said, because it will teach you about politics, uh, about the Iran, U.S. situation, but it'll teach you about politics in Washington. When I come back, I'll talk to Michael Singh. He's director of the documentary film Valentino's Ghost. Stay tuned.